Hey, stop looking at me. Shut those eyes real quick. We're going to do a little experiment. Go ahead and picture your ideal artist. Think about what it is you think they do in life. What's their living condition? What's their personality? How many souls have they sacrificed to gain their talents? All right, you can open your eyes now. What was it that you thought of? Was it someone in glasses hunched over a desk with a pen or pencil? Maybe you thought of someone with a brush and palette thinking through their next stroke while splattered with paint. Or maybe you thought of someone sitting at a piano, eyes shut in concentration, fingers dancing across the keys. Or maybe you read the title of this video and already guessed what it is we're here to talk about today. How am I supposed to maintain any narrative tension when you're constantly overanalyzing my titles to try to get a jump on me? You should be ashamed of yourself. Or not. I don't think you're going to guess anything else coming in this video, so I hope you enjoyed your one moment of comfortable predictability, because it's time to get started. Art is a tricky subject, and even trickier to define. Definitions in general kind of suck, and they're really only as useful as we allow them to be. Basically, if it helps you to conceptualize something, then it's great. But the second you get too caught up in the weeds about it, maybe it's time to just take a step back and recognize that not everything can be neatly packaged into just a single definition. Art, like the meaning of life, is singular to every single person. And while we can try to find through lines and patterns of usage, sometimes we just have to accept that definitions are an inherent limitation of the process of communication, and we just have to do our best to use verbosity to supplement what one word may lack in definitiveness. Whew. If all of that sounds too pompous, good. I agree with you. But I think it's important to define how slippery these things can get. As an English user, I understand how stupid this language is. So when I go on in a second to define what art is, it's important to me that you know that it's just for the use of this video. This is not at all the last word on all things artistic. With that being said, let's talk about art. A lot of people like to talk about what art isn't, but they kind of shy away from what art is. Well, I'm not scared. Art is anything that represents a concept, emotion, or experience in a way that a word or phrase could not accomplish alone. This is why people will normally point to the amount of think pieces someone has written on something as proof that it is art. If you can't summarize your thoughts on it in just a couple of words, if you need page upon page of text, it's probably art. See? That wasn't so hard. And I even hit you with the, for the purposes of our conversation, that's my definition of it anyway. So even if you disagree with me, you can just be mad about it. Because art is about defining these hard to define bits of our world, they tend to be at their best when they have something complicated to work with. If the art's about something simple, it tends to feel a bit flat, like it's not being used to its full potential. Most human emotions are extremely complex, and because of that, they tend to get used as a very good starting place for a lot of art, which can lead to the false conclusion that all art is inherently emotional. This is why despite having the word love, we still enjoy romantic art. The word helps us talk about the thing, but the art is how we actually examine every facet of it. Whatever you pictured your artist as, I bet you thought of a very right-brained person. Spontaneous, intuitive, maybe a bit scattered or messy. You'd be in the majority for thinking that way. Most people talk about right-brained folks as the artists, and I'm not here to say that that's wrong. But too many conversations about art sound like the second that something has a utility outside of being artistic, it's lost the magic. That's just too left-brained to be art, you know? They're just too... Those guys are just analytical, and they're all about numbers and crap. They don't know anything about art. I take issue with that. Why can't a thing just be what it is? So what if it has a utility? Maybe that has artistic value as well. Don't get me wrong. I do think emotion is a core part of art. But if you were paying attention to my definition from before, emotion isn't the only thing that art can convey. And that's where the Renaissance comes in. Imhotep, Pythagoras, Leonardo da Vinci, 
Copernicus, Lewis Carroll, and Donald Glover. Who are they and what do they have in common? They're all Renaissance men. What does that mean? Well, according to Rotten Tomatoes, Renaissance Man is defined as tries to simultaneously be a literary comedy, inspirational drama, and a star vehicle that caters to Danny DeVito's strengths, but proves to be a master of none. Oof, 53% audience score? That's certainly no twins. If we check a few other sources, though, we can discover that a Renaissance Man is not just a lackluster Danny DeVito 90s comedy. It's also a philosophy. For those of you who haven't taken world history yet, or just don't remember, and I don't blame you for that, the Renaissance was a period of time where the so-called Dark Ages gave way to new art and invention, mostly at the hands of Italians. People have argued the validity of the Renaissance existence. It benefits from a lot of outdated ideas about just how dark those ages really were, and it completely ignores the existence and ideas of most of the Eastern world at the time. So I'm just going to table that discussion because it requires more knowledge and tact than I have. So if you'd like to look into that more for yourself, feel free to do so after you've finished this video. For today, what matters more than if it existed is the idea that it existed. Many artists today look to the Renaissance for inspiration because so much of what they made is still iconic today. And if it ain't broke, the British will steal it and put it in a museum. And if it is broke, they'll still steal it, they just won't be as happy about it. What makes this time so fantastical is that so much wealth was flowing into Italy that the wealthy had so much excess that they started just paying artists to make cool shit, truly living the dream. Without the pressure of needing to make a living, those chosen few could instead focus on honing every skill imaginable in the pursuit of making the coolest shit possible. These were the Renaissance men. Fellas who just wanted to prove that humanity could do really anything we set our minds to, given we had the time and resources. Most famous for his jack-of-all-trades approach to life was Leonardo da Vinci, a man with interests in painting, science, writing, invention, and pretty much anything he could get his hands on. To Leo, art and science weren't separate practices, but they naturally flowed together, the right and left side of the brain functioning not as enemies, but as parts of the whole that they are. While it's true that our katana-wielding Ninja Turtle friend is most famous for his artwork, you're just as likely to recognize some of his diagrams and designs, like the Vitruvian Man. The Vitruvian Man is a diagram of a naked man inside of a square, which is itself inside of a circle. The man has two sets of arms and legs, which are in different orientations in an attempt to show the way that it affects his proportions. By studying the natural movements of the human body, this diagram might at first glance appear like something you'd see in a biology textbook. But if this is purely scientific, let me ask you something. Why did he go so hard on the face? That damn face takes this from being a standard diagram to something more. He took the time to add in details completely unrelated to the concept he was trying to display, and that begs me to look for something just beyond what first meets the eye. This isn't just a study in proportion. This is art, and it has a utility. So that leads me to the crux of this video. The Vitruvian Man is logical art. The purpose it was made for is not something we would usually consider to be artistic, but it conveys such a logical idea in such a profound way that it becomes artistic. That handshake agreement between the logical and creative is not just possible, it's already all around us if you know where to look for it. Don't believe me yet? That's fine, I've got plenty more examples. Let's start with every high schooler's reason to hate the letter X, math. For those of you in the audience with a trauma response to math, don't worry, this won't be your typical algebra or calculus. There will be a little bit of geometry in this section, but I'm here for you, and we're gonna get through this together. Math already has plenty of applications to art. If you've ever seen a Wes Anderson film, you'll know just how much symmetry can be an aesthetic. In the world of art, geometric shapes have plenty of basis in drawing. If you've ever bought one of those how to draw blank books, you'll know that plenty of things just start as a bunch of geometric shapes that you then toss about a billion details on top of. Basically, it shouldn't surprise anyone that math and art are a bit related. But so far I've just explained how math can be seen in art. What about math? 
being art. For that, we're going to have to talk about something called a mathematical proof. Math proofs are arguments attempting to show a mathematical truth. These arguments are typically structured as a step-by-step -step guide from one statement to the other, showing that if the first is true, the second must be also. And to the math nerds out there, yes, I'm aware this is an oversimplification, and it's just how direct proofs work, but we're trying to stay above water here, so no contraproofs or counterexamples today. These statements usually take a bit to make sense. Math proofs have their own grammar and terms that you have to decipher before you can even make heads or tails of what it is you're looking at. On top of that, once something is generally accepted to be proven, it can then be used as a part of a different proof, which can create this recursive rabbit hole of needing to understand this proof to understand this one and this one and this one, and you get the point. It can be exhausting for an outsider to try to understand any of this stuff. That can make it hard to tell if you should really even be impressed, because the types of proofs that can be understood without a PhD in math don't always do a great job of showing just how elegant some of these arguments can get. And while I do have an inconsistent upload schedule, I'm not about to take the time to get a doctorate just to release this video. Take this for instance. If I were to put this up and tell you that it proves that the equation for the area of a circle is correct, wouldn't you be a bit impressed with how concise it all is? It might not make all that much sense, and I am taking Proof Ricky's word for it that all of this is completely accurate, but just seeing all these symbols combined to make an argument for something so basic you might not have even thought about where we got it from, that's more than just analytical, right? There's a movement called minimalism that's been absolutely creaming the genes of people across the nation, and I think understanding that can help us better understand what's so fascinating about math proofs. Minimalism is an abstract art form that reduces things down to their most basic elements in an attempt to force an audience to just take in what's in front of them. This is oversimplifying things a bit, but I'm pretty sure the minimalists would appreciate that anyway. In many ways, minimalism asks why you added all those details to the How to Draw Blank books. The details might look nice, but they risk adding unnecessary noise, and there's nothing a minimalist wants less than adding too much noise. If I can tell what you're drawing just from basic shapes, maybe you're just done. Pencils down. No, leave, leave the poor diagram's face alone, Leonardo. Viewed through this lens, math proofs could be seen as an abstract art form where words are almost completely stripped out in favor for symbols and using the flow from one step to the next to do all the talking. That would satisfy my description of art, but even if you don't buy into my description, can you argue with the fact that they already fit pretty well into a previously established art form? Maybe the math is still too much to get past. No worries, I'm nothing if not thorough. Let's pivot to something I think everyone can get into. Ratatouille. Got your attention now, don't I? In the business, we call that a hook, and competent people put it in a video before wasting your time talking about math. Another great way to waste a hook is to put a bunch of stuff between it and the payoff. Anyway, baking, cooking, and mixology are very strange to me. Making food for the casual person is really just following something step by step. You measure and mix and heat and pour and crack and crimp and knead, and if you did it in the right amounts with the right tools in the right order, you'll get something that might be edible, and maybe, if you're lucky, it'll even be tasty. It feels like a pretty standard and logical process, but then you break out grandma's old pie recipe and that shit hits different. It's, it's still following instructions, but they're written in cursive on a yellowed note card by someone you know who altered and experimented with a recipe until it was unlike anything anyone else could have made. People always talk about making food with love, and if you've ever had the privilege of learning a recipe from the person who wrote it, you know what love tastes like. And I bet you know deep down that it's art. The food is no longer just for sustenance. There's a meaning behind it now. Making changes on the fly has a sort of hectic and creative flair that we can all get behind, but you still have to understand how to add the right ingredients and the basics of how they're going to heat up in the oven or pan or whatever heating apparatus you use. Knowledge and care are mixing together in a big old pot, and you have to use every single part of your brain if you want to make something great. Maybe that's too mushy for you, though. How about a drink? 
plenty of alcoholic drinks have names that would sound like they're from a cologne ad if you didn't know any better. Death in the Afternoon, Sex on a Beach, Old Fashioned, Manhattan? That's just a whole ass place. The reason for this is because, much like scents, some alcoholic drinks are named after the way they'll make a person feel. Which would imply that for some people, drinking alcohol is about the experience. Sounds like art to me. Hell, it's even got its own culture and art critics. Each drink says something about the person drinking it, and there are absolutely people who will judge you if your taste doesn't align with theirs. The people who judge you for drinking something fun are just snobby art critics who think that, that you are diluting the art by putting something that actually tastes good in your drink. And hey, they're valid. They're just more into brutalist mixology, whereas I prefer something a bit more pre-Raphaelite? Look, I researched a ton of art movements to make that joke, so the least you could do is look it up until it's funny. Can you believe this section started out with the promise I'd talk about Ratatouille? Anyway, let's talk about buildings, because really, what is a building if not a really big sculpture? New day, new shirt, worse hair, same shit. I think now is a good time to take a break and return to the start of this video. A while back I mentioned that when people think something has a use outside of just being artistic, it feels less like art. Obviously this whole video has been my attempt at contradicting that point, but in many cases the art I've mentioned does feel like the art was a happy accident rather than a direct intent, I can admit that. That's not to say that it makes any of the art any less important or real. If you believe in death of the author, then really the author's intent never mattered to begin with anyway. But I think if I want to make the claim that utility and art are not mutually exclusive, it would be nice to find a type of logical art that wants to be exactly that. Some practice where lots of intentional thought goes into not just the practical, but the creative side of its development. So let's talk about architecture. Louis Sullivan is a famous architect known for creating some of the earliest skyscrapers and for coining the phrase form follows function, which basically throws everything I just said right out the window. If function or the left brain thinking has to come before form or the right brain stuff, then art isn't really as important, it's just something you get to do if you have the time. And so this whole video is just a bust. Shit, I should have led with that, this would have been a way quicker video. Luckily for me, he had a pupil who set the record straight. Frank Lloyd Wright, who worked at Sullivan's architecture firm, had this to say. Form follows function, that has been misunderstood. Form and function should be one, joined in spiritual union. So the video's back on, baby! As a thank you to Frank, we'll even use one of his designs as our first example. The Guggenheim Museum was designed to display art of all kinds in a very unique way. Visitors would enter and take an elevator all the way to the top, where they would then follow a winding spiral staircase all the way back to the bottom, seeing art exhibits as they go. It was designed structurally to enhance the viewing experience of whatever art happened to be displayed in the museum. Frank was obviously thinking logically. The building can stand on its own, which is definitely useful, but there was always the intent to make sure the building wasn't just a place for art to go. He knew that the space that you view art in will have an effect on it, and he put a lot of thought into making sure that his building would meld with the art in it, creating a wholly new experience. Logical art. We're talking about buildings here, though, and as nice as it is to call an art museum artistic, the art's doing most of the heavy lifting there, right? Certainly other buildings don't have nearly as much creativity put into them, right? Well. Look no further than the Burj Khalifa, the world's tallest building. At 2,717 feet in height, or 828 meters, the Dubai native has been dropping jaws since its conception in 2010. But okay, big building, big deal, right? Impressive as it may be, breaking world records doesn't count as art, does it? The Burj Khalifa didn't just get thrown up overnight on the whims of someone who thought it'd be neat to break a world record. It wasn't just reinventing the wheel, it was taking a child's drawing of a horse cart and designing a car. The architectural advancements necessary to make this dream a reality were ridiculous, and everything had to be planned and tested long before it could be put into action. You don't want to find out that your building can't withstand high wind speeds after it's already a thousand feet up in the air. The Burj Khalifa stands as a testament to what humans are capable of. A modern day Tower of Babel. We built a tower stretching up into the heavens just to prove that we could, and we did it in the middle of a desert. It's cool shit. The Renaissance men would be proud. It's a sort of futurism that says, look at this. 
we took some place notorious for being largely inhospitable and made it possible for 10,000 people to just chill there with just one building. It's a look at one possible future for humanity, a vertical expansion in the face of the diminishing returns that its horizontal sibling inevitably faced. Whether you agree with the approach or not, the Burj Khalifa has captured the imaginations of so many people, and it stood like an icon of so many possibilities for what we can become. Maybe I talk about this too much, but I'm Catholic, so we're not going to end this section until I talk about cathedrals. Honestly, any religious building could probably fit here, but I'm only familiar with cathedrals, and this channel will always be subject to my biases, so we work with what we know. Feel free to talk about the art behind your religious buildings in the comments if you feel so inclined. Back to Catholic architecture, though. We could obviously talk about the Notre Dame and all of the intricate designs within, but really any building built with the purpose of being a church has a palpable energy to it. They are simultaneously a testament, pun intended, to the beauty possible in God's creation and large enough to fit a lot of people. Add in the acoustics necessary to make sure a voice can be heard in such a large space, and you've got yourself some quintessential logical art. There, every nook and cranny is a fusion between creative wonder and meticulous planning. And while we're kicking up our feet and enjoying these wonderful spaces, let's go ahead and fill the space with our next topic of the evening, music. Nailed it. Look, this section is just so I have an excuse to talk about the one thing I don't have to do a bunch of reading to understand. I'm no scholar of music theory, but I've been making some amount of coherently harmonic sound with at least one part of my body since I was like three years old, so I've picked up a good bit here and there. And with that experience, I can say with absolute certainty that music is a logical art. When I was in the high school band, yeah, I know, our director constantly told us about this study that showed that playing music lights up both sides of your brain. And if he could use that to justify sending a bunch of teenagers to pass out on the sweltering pavement on a hot summer afternoon, I think I can use it to justify art that uses both sides of your brain. In particular, music theory seems like such an oxymoronic concept, but if you want me to talk about how it actually makes a lot of sense that logically planning something out doesn't inherently mean it isn't creative, rewind the video a few minutes. I've talked about it like three other ways already. What makes music the most interesting logical art in my mind is that I don't have to explain it to you. Maybe you didn't think of it in this way, but I don't have to stretch your imagination to tell you that music is an art. With the other topics, I felt the need to explain myself so that it doesn't just look like I'm grasping at straws, but with music, I think you get it, right? Everyone likes music, and we all understand that some of the best artists understand not just how to put their emotions into their music, but the technical skills necessary to evoke that emotion. You can use principles and theorems to create something that will move someone to tears without ever needing to understand any of the thought that went into it. The person who can name the exact chords being used and the theory behind why is getting the same emotional experience as the person who has never even seen a Fisher-Price keyboard before. The skill and passion have combined into this powerful packet of auditory information for your brain to slurp up while you kick back and experience bliss. And that's something that I personally find pretty neat. So much art makes people feel like they need all this history and technical understanding to fully enjoy, but with music it's just so fully available and accessible. There are obviously songs and even genres that require a deeper understanding than others, but there's just so much music around that you're bound to find something that you can enjoy and appreciate with just even the most basic levels of music theory. So there you have it. I've covered all the bases I can, or at least all the ones I care to, so, convinced or not, that's all I have for you. Now what? If you've been tuned out since I mentioned math back at the beginning of the video, you can come back now. I'm done mansplaining food and buildings or whatever the hell I've been rambling about. So, why did I bother talking about all of this stuff? I mean, sure, it might be cool if you're as boring as I am, but is there any point to all of this? Am I going to end the Ratatouille clickbait video with a call to action? Maybe. I don't have to tell you. If I were to tell you though, it'd probably be something along the lines of go forth and find the art all around you. I want to make it extremely clear that when I spoke earlier about how people fall into the trap of thinking of all art as exclusively right-brained, I was not excluding myself from that list. Even while discussing logical art, I found it hard to stop myself from calling these things artistic purely based on how they make me feel. What I've tried to stress though is that 
even though there is plenty of value in feeling things, there's so much art to be found in the practical side of life too. We can and often do use logic to discuss art, and it's important not to think of the two as separate fields. Even more traditional arts have technical aspects, and if we stray away from the theory and the technique, we miss out on a whole extra layer of the art. I approached it from the opposite direction, but it is important to note that it's still there. There's an art in the technique, just as there's a technique in the art. One without the other is just half as good as it could be. How's that for a conclusion, assholes? Feels like a pretty good place to end it, right? In Pixar's award-winning French propaganda film Ratatouille, there's a character named Anton Ego who eats a ratatouille prepared by a half-French, half-American twink's kinky pet rat that is so delicious it makes him remember not to be a dick. That ratatouille was logical art. Never try to predict me. I live in a different universe! Plenty of alcoholic drinks have names that would sound like a cologne ad if you didn't know any better. Sex in the afternoon? Sex, that's not a drink. 